We're enough. We're enough. We want our brothers and sisters to come back. But you know what? We can change this world with just what we have in this room if we trust God. But what's it going to take? What's it going to take? What do you see when you look in the mirror? What do you see looking back at you? Do you are you judging what's looking back at you by the world standards? Or are you seeing what God sees? Because what God sees is different than what the world sees, isn't it? Now the devil wants to convince us otherwise. But what God sees is different. And that's what I want to talk about this evening. Uh, we talked about 1 Samuel, uh, uh, I think it was last Sunday morning, wasn't it? About the people standing up and saying, we want a king, we want a king, right? Remember that? And they got what they asked for and how'd that work for them? Not very well. And they found out real quick how bad it was going. And God says, now I want you to go, I want you to go anoint my king. The one that I picked. And that's where we're going to talk this evening. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and the first 13 verses. Because I want us to focus this evening on what is it that God sees. Quit looking at yourselves. Quit looking at your brothers and sisters. Quit looking at people out in the world with eyes of the world. We have something living inside us, don't we? We're supposed to be able to see through his eyes, right? Right? So what is it that God sees? So 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13. And as you're able, would you please stand for the reading of God's holy word and remain standing for a word of prayer. So the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest. But he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was a ruddy and, and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. So the word of God for God's people this evening. Be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your presence already in this place, Lord. We thank you for the word that you've already given us, Lord. We thank you for our faithful brothers and sisters who, who've been willing to share that word with us, Lord. Lord, we ask you to continue to be in our midst, continue to be in our prayer, continue to, to lead us and guide us in this service, Lord. And Lord, Lord, we pray that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be found pleasing in your sight this evening. And we ask this in Jesus' name, and amen. amen, amen. You may be seated. So I want to ask you this evening, have, have you ever experienced what it feels like to be excluded from something? Now, I know we've all been the, the fastest and the strongest and the most popular, and we've never been left out, right? No? We've all experienced it, haven't we? Maybe there's a time where you, you felt the sting of being the last one picked when, when people were picking teams to play a game. 
Or maybe you had to watch as, as one by one of the taller and the stronger and, and the more athletically gifted or, or simply those that were just more popular were chosen before you. Maybe it was the experience of not being asked to a dance by, by that one that you thought your life was going to end if they didn't ask you. Maybe it was being bullied by bigger or older boys or, or even girls. You know, they can be just as big of bullies as boys can, can't they? Truth be told, all of us can relate in one way or another, can't we? We've all felt that cold sting of being left out, haven't we? We can all relate to that. And it's simply, it isn't simply something you have to endure while you're growing up. It carries into adulthood, doesn't it? As adults, we may know the feeling of being passed over for a promotion as others move up the ladder. Or perhaps a, a friend has a party or, or has something going on and they invite everybody you know, but your invitation got lost in the mail. Whatever the exact details are, these kind of situations have a, a way of making us feel small and unimportant and overlooked and not as good. And sometimes... Sometimes they, they, they cause us to have wounds and we carry those wounds around and, and we never fully heal. We carry those wounds around far longer than we have to. God's trying to heal those wounds, but we, we insist on carrying those wounds around. We, can sit, we, 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 we insist on continually listening to those voices from long ago that told us things like we're not good enough or we'll never be good enough or, or we're not capable of doing this or that. People can have a tendency to leave others out, folks. We've even been guilty of the ones doing the, the, the leaving out, haven't we? At some time or another, right? We've been judged by outward appearance, and we've judged others by outward appearance, right? And we leave others behind. It happens in the world. It happens outside these doors, but guess what? We expect it to happen out there, right? Right? But what's even worse, it happens right here. It happens in churches every day. One time Terry and I, were we were contemplating changing churches, and we, we, we spent a few weeks going to different churches, and we went to a church called Olive Baptist, all right? And the day we walked, we knew a lot of people that went there, and, and the day we got there, we, we, we went to Sunday school, and we came up from Sunday school into the sanctuary, and and back there where Sandra Martin is sitting right now, the very back on that side right there sat somebody that looked like he had been living on the streets for about a month. He smelled, his clothes looked bad, he was dirty, didn't look like he'd had a, a shower or bath in weeks. And people walked by one after the other and found their seats. Some of them kind of looked. When they sat down, they kind of whispered things back and forth to one another. And then came time for the pastor to come up, and, and he came up. And he pointed out the young man sitting back there. And he proceeded to tell the church that that young man was a member of, of one of the religious groups at Marshall University, and he had asked him to come to church and to dress that way and to sit in that exact spot and not to say a word to anybody, just to see what the church would do. Folks, we've been guilty of judging people by outward appearances, haven't we? But thankfully, thankfully, God doesn't work that way. You know, we talked this morning about the kingdom of God, and, and thankfully that's, that's not how it's supposed to work in the kingdom of God, is it? We all said, praise God, we want to we wanna view the kingdom of God this morning, right? Well, judging by outward appearances don't fly in the kingdom of God, does it? It doesn't work that way. Last Sunday, as I said, we talked about the story from, from the 8th chapter of 1 Samuel. We talked about how up until that time, God had ruled the nation of Israel. He had raised up leaders as they were needed. That's how things operated. All the way from the time Moses led God's people, all the way through the judges. But we're told in 1 Samuel 8 that the people asked God for a king to rule them. Why? Why? Because they wanted to look like the rest of the world, right? They were looking with worldly eyes. They said, we, we need a king to rule over us such as other nations have. 
Why does the grass always look greener on the other side of the fence? I've heard that saying my entire life, right? Everybody's heard that saying. The grass isn't always greener, right? One day as I was driving to Sunrise United Methodist Church, it was about a 20 minute, I could go there five different ways from my house, and each way was about 20 minutes. And the way I always liked to go, I was driving through the country on a little, uh, a lane and a half road, we'll say, all right? And there was a cow, and I've never seen a cow's neck that long because it had it stretched about that far through the barbed wire fence eating grass on that side of the fence that didn't look a bit different than the grass that was on the side of the fence he was standing on. Yet there the cow was. The grass always looks greener on the other side of the fence, right? But anyway, the Lord told Samuel, he said, why are you so worried about it? He said, they have rejected me as their king as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. And God warned them at that time. He said putting a person on the throne would bring political corruption and trouble. He told them that, didn't he? He told Samuel, go tell them that. And Samuel did, and what did they say? We don't care. We want a king. Well, guess who was right? God was right, wasn't he? Saul was the first king, and, and boy, Saul passed the eye test, didn't he? I mean, if you were going to pick a king, Saul's the kind of guy you would, you would envision, wasn't he? The Bible tells us he was everything that you would picture when you were picking a king. Of all the men lined up there, Saul was a giant of a man, wasn't he? I mean, he was an imposing figure. He was good-looking and charismatic, and, and in all appearances... Saul was a natural-born leader. But there was a problem. Outside, he looked like the perfect leader. But inside, where it counted, inside, Saul didn't have what it took to be a leader, did he? You see, he let the power go to his head. And he turned away from following God, and, and he became corrupt. He conquered territories to, to make himself rich. And he was unjust toward the poor and, and corrupted the worship of God. Yet in the eyes of the world, Saul looked pretty successful, didn't he? He was going around uh, 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 conquering nations after nations and, and taking more and more territory. He looked like a success. But again, God doesn't look through the eyes of the world. God looks at things a little bit different. God has a different perspective. And we can read in the very end of chapter 15 of, of 1 Samuel. It says, And the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. Well, I don't know about you, but that would be something awful to read about myself, wouldn't it? That the Lord was sorry that he made me anything. But he was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. And in the beginning of our scripture here from 16, we read where God told Samuel, I have rejected him from being king over Israel. And he says, I will send you to Jesse, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And then after some initial concern about, about what would happen if Saul found out, Samuel went. And I'm sure that while he was traveling to Bethlehem, as, as he was going to the home of Jesse, he was, he, he was developing a picture in his mind of what the next king was going to look like, right? He had to be doing that. Wouldn't we have been doing that? We'd already had his picture in our mind before we even got there. He was expecting to find another great, big, strong, charismatic leader among Jesse's sons. And as soon as he saw Eliab, he thought for sure, that's it. That's the picture I've been walking all these miles with in my head. That's him. That's got to be him. That must be the Lord's anointed right in front of me. But the Lord Sam said to Samuel, Have no regard for his appearance or stature because I haven't selected him. You see, we have a way of looking at things, don't we? We have a way of looking at things. But God has his own way of looking at things. And God's ways are not our ways. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. He doesn't see what the world sees when he looks at me. What's even better? He don't see what I see when I look at me. 
We can only see what's visible to the eyes, but God can see what's in our hearts. That's good news, isn't it? Or it should be. Now, sometimes it's a little bit scary. I'll have to admit it. Sometimes it's a little scary that God can see my thoughts and He can see my heart and He can see I might be able to fool you, but I can't fool Him. In a world where it seems that, that you're first judged strictly by how you look, and once that judgment's made, how long is that judgment going to stand? Once the world decides what you are, that's what you are. You might as well chisel it in stone, right? But God looks not at your hair. He don't look at your complexion. He don't look at your body composition. He don't care. He looks into your heart. There was a book... Uh, I forget what year it was written. I, I meant to write it down, but I didn't. But anyway, it was called American Girls, Social Media and the Secret Lives of Teenagers. The author talks about the culture of social media. Now, we've all become social media experts in the last year, right? If we weren't already, right? Everybody's got you get locked in that Facebook hole, and you look up and you think, where did the last hour go, right? Anybody else do that? And in this book, she quotes a 13-year-old girl. 13-year-old girl from New Jersey. And this girl said, we're on it 24-7 and it's ruining our lives. She said, it's all we do. She said, beautiful, hot, gorgeous, sexy. Those are the responses given to selfie pictures in the culture of social media. Responses which many girls seek as they spend minutes or hours of their day preparing themselves to be photographed and even photographing themselves to their best advantage. Why? Because for many girls, the pressure to be considered beautiful is felt on a nearly continual basis. That's all they see and that's all they hear. In the book, a 12-year-old girl is quoted as saying, how you look is all anybody cares about anymore. Being beautiful nowadays is seen as way better than being smart. Folks, that's the world we're living in. And if people aren't pretty nowadays, they're done with their life. Like I'm not pretty, I can't live. That's what the world's selling our children right now. Right now. They got their phones out or their computers on and they're looking and that's the message that they're getting. That's the life that they're living in. And it's easy for us to say things like, they shouldn't let things like that get to them. But they're surrounded by it from the time they wake up until the time they go to bed. It's on the television. It's on their telephones. It's on their computers. It's in their schools. And saddest of all, in many cases, it's in the church. You know, the church that tells them, well, if you're going to come to church, you need to show up dressed like this and you need, to, you need to show up looking like that. And why you come in here looking like you stuck your face in a tackle box with things hanging all over you? Right? We tell them they have to dress a certain way or look a, a certain way. And what are we telling them? We're telling them that if you want to experience the love of God, you've got to look the way I say you need to look. And then we wonder why we can't attract people. It's a lie. It's a lie, isn't it? God loved you and you didn't look too pretty, didn't he? She goes on to write, Social media creates a heightened sense of competition and inferiority. And the devil loves it when we're dealing with inferiority. He loves it. He loves it. But guess what, church? That message didn't just come around when social media started. It was around long before social media came about, wasn't it? It was even around when Samuel was trying to discern which of Jesse's boys God had chosen to be the next king. But even then, people still judged by exterior appearances. After seven sons passed before Samuel and all seven were rejected, Samuel finds out there's one more son. 
They're still the youngest son, Jesse says, but he's out keeping sheep. Even Jesse was judging by appearances. He didn't even think to have David come in, did he? Truth be told, neither Jesse or anybody else in the family ever expected anything to come from David. Truth be told, they didn't expect anything out of him. They had all resigned to the fact that being a shepherd, that tending somebody else's sheep was all that he was ever or would ever be good for. He was the last and the least of the sons. And while the other boys were being paraded in front of Samuel, David was out in the field doing his humble job, watching his father's sheep. As a matter of fact, Jesse didn't even mention David by name. He wasn't even important enough to be mentioned by name. He said, well, they're still the youngest one, but he's out taking care of sheep. Samuel says, send for him. And we know the story, right? As soon as he walks in, what God say? He said, that's the one. You go anoint him. He's the one I've chosen. And we're told that the Lord's Spirit came over David from that point forward. See, I believe the reason they dismissed David, the David they knew wasn't the same David after he was anointed because the Lord's Spirit came over him and he was different from that day forward. Amen. So the one rejected and passed over by the others was the very one that was picked by the Lord. The first book in the New Testament, Matthew, written over a thousand years after David was anointed as king, begins in the very first, vo very first verse a record of the ancestors of Jesus Christ Son of David. See, so we need to be careful how we assess those around us. And we need to be careful how we assess ourselves. Because we might look at some people and think that, that God couldn't possibly use that person. And right now, God's asking you to do something. He's got an important work for you to do. You say you want to see revival in our land. You want to see revival in our church. God's got an important work for you to do. But guess what? You look in the mirror and you say there's no possible way that God can use that person. Send it to somebody else. I'm not worthy. We've all looked at ourselves that way, haven't we? Amen or ouch. How many of you ever thought that? God can't use me. I want you to hear me tonight. If you don't hear nothing else, that's a lie. That's a lie. We read that God can raise up bones and make an army out of them. Surely he can use you, right? The Bible's filled with misfits. Read the stories. None of them are anybody we pick, are they? It's full of outcasts, people that are disregarded and thrown out by man. But God used them in a mighty way. A mighty way. We've been studying Moses for a long time. What do we know about Moses? He was a spoiled palace brat. And then he was a murderer. He couldn't speak very well. He stuttered. He made excuses. Yet what was God able to do through Moses? Every bit of us are just as qualified as Moses. We just need to trust the same power source that Moses trusted. We need to do what Tyler told us to do this evening. We need to let God be God. Amen. Say, use me however you want me. I don't understand it, and I don't think I can do it, but I don't need to because you can. God sees purpose in your life, even where you might see none. He sees purpose in your life tonight. He sees potential where all you see is failure and flaws. We're good at picking out our own flaws, right? We pick out everybody else's to cover for ours, right? Maybe if I deflect it on them, people won't see all these flaws that I have on my own. God sees strength where we see weakness. And folks... 
when God looks at you, every time he looks at you, he sees unimaginable beauty in each and every one of you. In the gospel lesson of Mark, Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your being and with all your mind and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Folks, we're living in a world where, where I believe now more than any other time in history. I think it's been around forever, but I believe now more than any time in history, the world is obsessed with outward beauty. Outward beauty is supreme. Over character, over intelligence, over everything else, outward beauty is the, is the trump card over everything, right? Children are taught that the most important thing is how they look. And I don't know why things pop in my head, and you probably don't know why either, but when I was preparing this, as I was writing this, and, and God was giving me this, an old Saturday Night Live skit came to my mind, of all things. All right? It was an old Saturday Night Live skit that, that, that Billy Crystal used to use. That's how far back I'm going, all right? Where he would say it's better to look good than to feel good. You all remember the skit, or some of you do, right? Usually after he said that, what would he say? And you look marvelous, right? But folks, that's not what life is about. That's not what life is about. If it were, we'd be a sorry lot, wouldn't we? For all those who have at one time or another found themselves to be the last ones picked in gym class, for all those that have been picked on, been overlooked, been made fun of, for all those that have ever, ever, for whatever reason, been made to think that they are less than anybody else, I want you to remember one name, David. Remember David. You know the one. The man after God's own heart, that David. That little shepherd boy that was discounted and disregarded by his father and his brothers and everybody else. His family might have thought that all he would ever be good for was taking care of somebody else's flock. Well, guess what? They were right. They were right. He was the only one that was suited for taking care of God's flock because that's what he was selected to do. Amen? Amen. Can't you just imagine the surprise on everybody's face when David come walking in and Samuel got all excited from that word that he got from the Lord? Could you imagine a look on his brother's faces? We kind of get a glimpse of what they thought about David, don't we? When he, when, when he came to, when the story of David and Goliath, when he came to bring them supplies. What are you doing here? They disregarded him even then, didn't they? Imagine a look on their face. When God chose him to be king. So this evening, sit up a little taller in your pew, people. All right? Hold your head up a little bit higher. Don't walk around defeated and downtrodden. Why? Because God doesn't look at you like humans look at you. And praise God, he don't look at you the way you look at you. He sees power in you. He sees beauty in you. He sees strength in you. He sees great victories coming from you, and all you want to do is sit there defeated and say, we need this or we need that. You don't need anything but God because he can use you. Humans see only what's visible to the eyes, but God sees our hearts. Stop buying that, that our outward appearance is all that matters. And more importantly, more important than buying it, stop selling it. Stop telling people that. You want to see the church grow? Stop selling that nonsense. The world's already telling them that we're sitting up here looking down on them and telling them they're less than us and they're worse than us. And when we go out and act like that, guess what? We reinforce what the world is telling them. 
Stop selling it. You can buy all the Mary Kay you want to. You can go to Alta and get all the urban decay you want. You can have the finest clothes and, and you can have things lifted and tucked and Botoxed and, and all other things that people do today and it ain't going to matter. God's not looking there. He's not looking there. He's not looking at your hairdo. He's not looking at how you, you put your makeup on. He's not looking at any of that stuff. He's looking at your heart right now. Right now, He's looking into your heart. And ask yourselves this evening, what is He seeing? I don't know why God gave me this message other than somebody here, somebody here needed to hear that this evening. And what's more important? There's a whole world outside these doors that need to hear that this evening. And they need to hear it from God's people. And they don't need to hear it by us telling them that. They need to hear it through our actions. As a church, you want to be the church? Do you want to be the church of Jesus Christ? Do you want to be the church where Jesus is the head of the church? Do you want to be the church that has victory and sees souls saved and, and lives changed? Do you want to be that church? Then go share this message with the world. It'll touch lives, and it'll change hearts, and it'll save souls. And I can't think of anything else that would be greater than that. Can you? Start showing people what God sees when he looks at them. Because every other voice they hear in the world, every other voice is telling them something completely different. And after Jesus ascended, between the time he ascended and the time he comes back, who is the body of Christ? Everybody that's the body of Christ, I want to see your hand. All right? So it's you. You're the one that's responsible to go show the world how Jesus looks at them. That's your job. That's your job. And God has equipped you. From the time you were, the time he knit you together in your mommy's womb, God made you for that job. Do you believe that this evening? Then get outside these doors and share that.